Oh. Hi, everyone. I just want to give a few more minutes for people to join and then we will start shortly. All right, um, I'm going to get started. Um, there was a question that was sent to me about essays. Just a reminder that essays were going to have a tutorial on how to go about doing an academic essay for psychology. And that will be next week, Thursday. I mean, next week, Friday, sorry. And details of that will be communicated with you next week via me and by your tutors. And yeah, don't worry about it too much just yet. Remember the essay is due, I think on the 23rd of May. So there is going to be plenty of time and we will give you some proper guidance as far as referencing and what we want from the essay goes. All right, so um, we're here for you. We're gonna be looking after you and supporting you and all of that stuff. And with that, let me get started on the lecture. I decided since yesterday was a um, pre-recorded lecture, I know that I uploaded it late and my apologies for that. So I thought I would give a quick little recap on what I did yesterday because it is pretty imperative for what we are doing today. And obviously you should be going through lectures each day, but since the one was uploaded quite late, um, for Wednesday, I do understand how it might have been difficult for you guys to have gotten to it. So I'm going to do a little TLDR of that quickly. If you don't know what TLDR means, that's too long, didn't read. 
So I'm going to do that quick sticks and then, yeah, we'll get started on today's lecture. <laughs> okay, so yesterday I uh, started us on neurons and neural transmission. So those are basically all the brain cells. You can see there, lecture seven, brain cells, part one. So you can only imagine what we're going to be doing today. And let's go through it. So we're going to talk about neurons, specifically the two types of neurons, and then glia cells, which support the neurons, and then the somat somatosensory system, which is how those neurons all then form a network, specifically the sensory neurons. Um, to then relay information to our brain based on what touch is being felt in that exact moment. I'm going to open the chat and keep it next to me in the corner so I can keep it on everything. And I'm going to start recording now. So let me start from the previous slide just so the recording can see it. All right, so just to recap, um, for anyone who's just joined us, I'm going to go quickly through what we did yesterday, just for a recap, because it kind of leads on to what we're doing today. And yeah. Please do mute yourselves. Um, yeah, okay. So let's, let's do it. Ooh. Okay. So neurons, we're going to talk about motor and sensory neurons. Glia cells, we're going to talk about astrocytes, microglia, and oligodendrocytes, and how all three of those help our neurons. And then we'll talk about the somatosensory system, which is how sensory neurons tell our brain what's going on. We're just going to quickly whiz through this because this was yesterday's pre-recorded lecture. Obviously, I go into a lot more detail um, yesterday um, about all this stuff. So, yeah. If you are a little bit too confused about what I'm doing right now and you don't know what's going on, just yeah, go look up, go look at the one from yesterday. Okay, so communication in the nervous system. Our communication network is the nervous system because it is information processing and transportation. That's what's going on. Our neurons are basically relaying information to all parts of our body and all parts of our brain and all together that is going to tell us what's going on or what needs to be told and all of that stuff. This is done by neurons, which are also called nerve cells. They communicate with other neurons and parts of our body, which are effector sites, and they receive, integrate, and transmit electrochemical signals. This very strange thing over here is a neuron. All right. Then glia cells, glia cells are basically structural support and insulation for the neurons. So they help the neurons out. So the neurons are the main characters and then the glia cells are kind of like their best friend that's kind of next to them making jokes and stuff like that. Okay, so here's our neuron, it's the yellow thing. And then this and this are two of the types of glia cells. And you can see they're kind of just helping things along. They're not the main characters. She is. She is big and gorgeous and gold. And these ones are kind of just, you can see they're giving some support. And you can see this one's probably assisting in something too. Okay. So first to look at neurons. So... Firstly, I laid down the components and structure of a typical neuron. So this is something we'll see in all neurons. It has a soma, which is the cell body. Dendrites, which are the branches. Okay, they receive information. An axon, which is a long, thin fiber that transmits signals away from the soma. The signal is going to go to other neurons. You can see the signals being passed along there. Today, we're going to talk about the mechanics of that and what's happening on a microscopic level in these neurons and then at the axon terminal this is where the signals will then be transmitted to another cell okay I did change this um, it will be changed in the uploaded ones that I upload for you guys um, but don't know why it hasn't changed yet now the basic flow of information then is information comes into the dendrite through the soma down the axon to the end of the axon, the terminal, sometimes the terminals will look different. That's why I didn't include it here. 
to the dendrites of a new neuron or to an effect site if this is attached to an effect site. Okay, we'll see what all this means now when we look at the specific types of neurons. Okay, other two things that you need to take note of, they're not on this one, but you can see here, you can see on the axon, there are these weird little cells, okay? They're myelin sheaths, okay? So it's basically this wrapped around thing. I don't know if you've ever seen those container things that you can buy that are like bubble gum and then it's like wrapped up like tape, basically. That's what the myelin sheath looks like. And it's basically wrapped around the axon. It helps to speed up the firing of neurons, okay? So as the signal passes through from the dendrite to the soma along the axon, it speeds up this thing here. Someone asked, is it kind of like an optic fiber cable? Yes, Ezra, that's exactly what it's like. It's basically sending things along quicker. I like to think of the axon as like the wires inside, um, just like a typical cable. And then the myelinated sheath or the myelinated fiber, sorry, or myelin sheath as kind of the insulation around the cable. So in our case, it's normally that plastic, okay? Um, you'll also notice though that there's little gaps in between. So it's not continuous. You can see it'll be some myelin, then a gap, more myelin, gap. Those are called nodes of Ranfear, those little gaps. They are small gaps with no myelin sheath. Their function is a little bit strange, so I don't need you to know it for now. All you need to know is that the myelin sheath is there to speed up firing. And if there's no myelin sheath, that gap is called a node of Ranfear. We'll talk about Schwann cells now, um, well, a little bit later when we talk about glia cells. Okay. First type of neurons, motor neurons, okay? The soma, so the cell body part, that is going to be found in our spinal cord. And then the motor neuron is going to stretch the axon all the way to where it needs to go. Its effect site is going to be a muscle or its effector site, okay? So again, remember, dendrite receives the signal. It will be from other neurons. Then the impulse goes down the axon. You can see here's the arrow always showing the direction down the axon, axon. And then the axon terminals are attached to a muscle. Okay, so motor neurons always lead to a muscle. Then sensory neurons, their dendrites are attached to a sensory ending. Again, this was wrong. I changed it, but it's unchanged itself. But it's supposed to say here that the dendrite are attached to a sensory ending. And then you can see from the dendrite, it receives the signal from the sensory ending because it's sensitive to a part of a type of stimulation. This travels down to the soma. You can see the soma isn't immediately there attached to the dendrites. There's a little bit of a pathway. Then the soma, then the axon, and then the terminals. Okay. So please note these are the axon terminals. Remember, follow the arrows, wherever the arrows are going to end up. That's the terminal. The beginning part is the dendrite. So this should say dendrites attached to a sensory ending. Okay. So just something we spoke about on Tuesday is neural pathways and reflex arcs. Okay. And a neural pathway what happens is those things we just spoke about, the sensory endings will be here. So the dendrites of a um, sensory neuron, they'll be there. They're going to carry the impulse along, okay? All the way to the sensory axon over here. It's then going to pass through a synapse, which we're going to talk about, and then carry on going to where it needs to go. Once it reaches here, your brain's going to perceive what it is because remember sensory neuron is carrying a sensory impulse, relation. That's going to say, okay, cool. This information needs to go to this part, the motor cortex, something, something. So wherever that needs to be processed. Then that's going to go down from the dendrites and you can see there the soma of that one and go down, 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 down down, 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 always via the spinal cord. Remember, that's how things go down to the rest of our body. 
and then back to our hand to those muscles because remember the effect of sight at the end of a motor neuron is the muscle and it's going to tell our body okay cool as soon as this gets too hot and my sensory neuron tells my brain okay it's hot now my muscles will pull my hand away okay you can see this is quite a process that being processed as a motor impulse and then your hand gets pulled away when this ha needs to happen quickly so say you touch your hand there and it's too hot immediately if you put your hand there for two for any second longer it's going to start burning okay that is going to be done through a reflex arc a reflex arc is basically a shortcut where instead of going all the way from a sensory neuron up to your brain, down, motor neurons, muscle pulled. It goes like this, up to your spinal cord, to some part in your spinal cord, whatever is like closest to it, basically. And then right back out again. So sensory, motor. Okay. And because of that, our reflexes can be quicker because it's basically taking a shortcut. You can see here from the receptor, that's from the sensory part. So here it's skin, skin's the most common one. Sensory neuron carries it, and then it gets taken right back out again to the muscle in the finger, and it contracts by the motor neuron. Okay, this isn't too important. This is kind of just showing how the sensory and motor neurons work together. You can see here is something called an interneuron. An interneuron basically is the in-between phase from the sensory into the motor, but we're not going to look at interneurons, okay? Their only function is to kind of, you know, help out. So it's more important for us to know the two differences. Glia cells then, I'm just going to race through this. There are cells that then support neurons. There's three types, astrocytes that help create the blood brain barrier, the blood-brain barrier, you need to revise lecture one if you want to know about that, okay? Microglia, they basically act like our immune system and they um, clean up dead cells in our uh, nervous system. Okay. And then oligocytes cease. In the, same. the oligodendrocyte will eventually become. A I went into more detail in the previous lecture. This is just a bit of a TLDR. Okay. So, matter sensory systems now. I don't know why I'm getting feedback on my side. I think someone might have the mic open or something like that. So please make sure that your marks are muted. Let me know if you can't hear me or if I sound. Okay, I've been told that um, I am glitching a little bit. So just keep letting me know if you can't hear me or something like that. I could hear there was some weird feedback. So it seems okay again now, but yeah, keep me updated. Thank you. So somatosensory system, again, I'm just going to race through this because this isn't pertaining to what we were talking to about today in our lesson. But basically, the ends of our axons, those axon terminals, can have different little things on top of them that pick up different types of um, sensations. Okay, they're called mechanoreceptors. We have Meissner's corpuscles for... Um, normal touch it's normally concentrated in our fingers and hairless skin it's quite close to the surface because it's just normal touch okay Pacinian corpuscles they're sensitive to vibration and pressure so it's deeper within our bodies okay they're made up of layers going around and around a free nerve ending and then Merkel's discs, they are sensitive to pressure, position of touch, and light touch. They're slowly adapting, which means that they'll continuously be telling your body, okay, something is touching you right now. You are wearing clothes. I can feel the clothes on our body. We're not going to focus too much on it, but I can feel the clothes on my body. That kind of thing. Okay. So that was the stuff from yesterday. I'm not going to take questions on that because that was from yesterday. I want to move on to what we're doing today.
All right. I'm now going to share my screen again. And today we're going to be doing um, how these things now transmit signals on a cellular, well, they're already on a cellular, on a microscopic level, should I rather say. All right, so neurons and neural transmission, brain cells part two electric boogaloo. That's what we're doing today. Okay, it's not a long lecture, which is why I went into the stuff before. So we had a little bit more context, but basically this is what we're going to look at. We're going to look at neuron electrochemical activity. And that's basically how those signals are transmitted. At resting potential, that's when the neuron isn't firing something, but can maybe fire something. Action potential is once a signal is being sent through a neuron. And then I can hear I'm glitching again. Just let me know if I'm inaudible. And then I'm going to talk about different ways that the signal and channel can be disrupted. Okay, I'm going to channel disruption. You'll find out what that means just now. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about what a synapse is because that once um, electrochemical activity has covered through a neuron, it needs to get passed on to the next neuron because remember they form that neural network. There's a synapse between those that then needs to be jumped by that signal. And we're going to talk about how that happens. All right, these are Ed and Frankie, my friend Alex's dogs, and they're going to take us through this lecture. I have someone asking, will the PDF slides for lectures five, six, and seven be uploaded onto Are You Connected? Yes, I'm going to upload um, lecture slides for each lecture series um, the following Monday after it's been completed. So this has been lecture five, six, seven, and now today, eight. They'll be uploaded on Monday. I might upload them a bit earlier because then maybe people can use the long weekend to catch up. Okay. Electrochemical activity, the first thing we're going to be doing today. So in the 50s, two guys named Alan Hodgkin and then something Huxley, I can't remember. They discovered the mechanics of neural transmission by studying action potential of neurons in the giant squid. The giant squid's axons are about 100 times larger than human axons. Human axons, we can't see with the naked eye. So these bad boys, they could actually like study and look at which is quite insane to think about what they found is that the fluids inside and outside neurons contain ions so by fluids i mean literally you know all our cells exist in fluids because they can't exist without water because they'll become dehydrated blah 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 so what they found is that that the fluid inside cells that exists and the stuff that the cell is then floating in. They both contain ions. Ions are electrically charged particles, okay? Examples are basically any element that carries a charge, which is all of them, so like sodium, potassium, calcium, chlorine, all of those. They all carry a charge, which means that they um, will make something more positive or negative, okay? Neurons, when they're at rest, they have more negative ions inside them than outside, okay? At rest, we mean that they're in inactive or they're at resting potential. By more negative ions, we mean that the ions that are inside the neuron, there's more negative ones than positive ones, okay? And they're quite, in its natural state, not doing anything, a neuron has a negative charge, okay? So, resting potential is when the electrical charge across the cell membrane is existing in the absence of stimulation. That's its resting potential, okay? Potential always means like to do with charge or voltage and that kind of thing. Um, here, it's when there's no stimulation, this is what the charge is doing. It's at its resting potential. So at resting potential, the concentration of charged ions are as follows. There are more sodium and chloride ions outside, and there are more potassium and large protein ions inside. You can see I put pluses and minuses there to show what their charge are. Sodium and potassium ions are positive, and chloride and protein molecules have negative charges. Okay, you can see here in a diagram what I mean. 
intracellular always means within the cell and extracellular always means outside. Okay, overall inside of the membrane at rest, there is a charge of negative 70. So you can see where I said it's more negatively charged, negative 70 millivolts relative to the extracellular side. That relative two is quite important because we're going to see in some of the diagrams, sometimes they'll say negative 90, sometimes they'll say negative 50, blah, blah, blah. What we're saying is like relative to the outside, there's like about a negative 70 difference, okay? So keep that in mind. So inside of cell, more negative than the outside of the cell. Think of me, I'm quite a negative person. So um, relative to the outside, so everyone else, I'm quite negative. Okay, think of it like that. Okay, there is a store of energy in the intracellular side, so inside the cell, relative to the extracellular side. So since there is a charge, whenever there's a charge, like... I always think of it, um, I'm not a very good chemistry teacher, although that's what I've been doing for the past three months. But I always think of it relative to like human terms. There is a, there's a little bit of a vibe, like something could happen. Okay. Since the inside then is more negatively charged than the outside, there's a charge. Okay which means there's polarized. So inside the cell, there's more negatively charged ions. I said there, there are some positive and there are some negative, okay? Outside and inside. But overall, inside the cell, intracellularly, there are more negative ions. So I, inside the cell, have a negative charge. On the outside of the cell, so in the space around the cell, it is more positive relative to me. Okay. Since there's a difference now, so since I am not the same as the outside, I'm more negative, it is more positive to, than me. There is a charge difference. If there is a charge difference in chemistry, we call that it is polarized. Okay. So to recap, Inside, more negatively charged in the cell. Outside, more positively charged, which means that it is polarized. When something is polarized, it means it's going to want to react, okay? Because it's going to want to even things out. The negative charge inside the cell, they maintain that by leaking potassium out of the cell. So in case some cells, because things are coming in and out all the time, just little by little, if it drops too much, in order to make sure that the cell stays negative inside, it might get rid of a little bit of potassium because potassium has the positive charge. You can see here, this is potassium. Potassium has the symbol K. So K plus, we can see some is coming out of the cell. He has the intracellular space. He has the cell membrane. Some is coming out just to maintain that negative because obviously if positive ions are going out, it means that there's going to be more negative ions overall. Okay, we'll talk about all this other stuff just now. Now, action potential is when this changes and we're suddenly going from being negative to positive. Okay. At resting potential, channels and pumps are closed. We can see here some channels and pumps. Okay, channels and pumps are basically protein molecules that are found in the cell membrane that allows ions in and out. Okay, that's their function. They're basically gateways. That's why we call them channels. Sometimes we call them pumps because it literally forces the things out and energy is involved. All you need to know is that at a potential, so when the Neuron is not really allowing things out. Diffusion just happens through, so these, are, these channels aren't too involved, but at resting potential, the rule is that they are closed. Okay, some things might escape through, separate thing. Okay, but when the membrane reaches the threshold, which is the required amount of stimuli for a neuron to respond, channels will open. So what that basically means is when there's enough stimuli passing through that membrane. Because remember, 
a neuron is a nerve cell. So the cell has a membrane when there's enough stimuli entering through the cell from the dendrites into the soma. And the neuron basically is like, okay, cool. I've got some energy. Those channels are going to start opening. The point at which this happens is called your threshold. Okay. You can see here, as I said, some people say negative 90, some will say negative 50. We were using negative 70 millivolts. But yeah, basically, this is our resting potential. As soon as a little bit more energy enters the cell based from the stimuli, so the stimuli provides that energy, we reach something called a threshold level. When that threshold level happens, the channels start opening. The first thing that happens is that sodium channels, which is Na, they open and we see a big shoot up in energy. Why? Because we're going from negative to positive and sodium is positive. So suddenly the overall charge inside the cell goes from being super negative to positive because positive ions are coming in. Since it's going from negative to positive, and basically crossing over from a negative to a positive charge. This is called depolarization because we're going from having a polarized cell, which is the difference between the inside of the cell's charge, charge and it's kind of even a polarization. Okay. Since these channels are open, like I said, sodium is going to be let in and raise the voltage. Voltage is the positive or negative thing. So you can see uh, we go from a negative and then it's going to go up, up, up towards zero. So it's being depolarized because now the charge is zero. It's neither positive nor negative. So it's no longer polarized. And then it's going to carry on getting more positive as more sodium enters and the voltage is raised. Eventually though, this is going to close and then potassium ions are going to enter in. That's called repolarization. That spike is basically what causes a stimuli to carry through and travel through a neuron. Okay, to continue on, how then is this action potential, um, how does it form? So these sodium channels are basically opening along the axon as the stimuli comes in. So remember, stimuli comes in, then suddenly as it's reaching here, these sodium channels are going to have enough energy, so they're going to open, and we're going to see sodium rush in, and it gets depolarized. As it gets depolarized, it's going to send the stimuli again along, and then suddenly the next set are going to depolarize because they're going to open and let sodium in. And this is going to keep happening. As this happens and it carries along, Repolarizing is going to happen behind it, and you can see how this travels along. And then the repolarizing happens behind it. Okay. Eventually, then it will go back to resting potential. So you can see then that the stimuli travels in here, 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 carry on as those channels open all the way to the axon terminal. This is called propagation. Okay. It, being propelled forward, basically. That's how I remember, propagation propelled, going forward. This means that the electrical charge is now traveling along the axon because as the positives are going to come in and then the negatives are going to come in and repolarize, that charge gets traveled along, okay? As this is happening as well, it's going to trigger a neurotransmitter to get released. Okay, so neurotransmitters are basically going to be used to pass the synapse. So as the signal travels through, neuro neurotransmitters that exist in the cell, in the neuron, are going to say, hey, that signal, I'm going to follow it, okay? We, we work well together. And they're going to follow each other and then end up at the end of the cell. And then we're going to see what happens when they reach a synapse. However, this process can get interrupted if the sodium channels are not allowed to open properly. So anything that blocks sodium channels is going to inhibit a signal. 
Because obviously, if something is blocked there, it can't depolarize because we can't have the positive sodium coming in. And then the signal kind of gets stuck. Okay, it doesn't, can't go anywhere because no, it no longer can travel along. So someone asked, so when the sodium channels open, does the sodium just stay in or does it get out? When the channels open, remember it goes from the outside in. Because remember, we said there's more sodium outside than in. So it's going to travel through to the inside of the cell. Please just explain again what we mean by depolarize. Depolarize means that we go from having negative inside the cell and outside, um, and the outside cell being positive, outside the cell being positive, to positive things coming in through the channels, making this less negative, less negative, less negative, less negative as more positive comes in. It's eventually going to have no charge because the negative charge that was inside has been balanced out with the positive charge. And then since there's no charge, it is depolarized. Depolarization means that there is a charge difference. Depolarized means that that charge um, difference has been eliminated. Okay. So if sodium channels can't open, that depolarization can't happen. Since depolarization can't happen, the signal can't pass through. Some things that can block sodium channels include local anesthetics, such as ketamine and propofol, anticonvulsants, including the dr um, drug oxcarbazepine, which is also used in some bipolar treatment if other medication is working. Antiarrhythmia drugs, which help with um, any arrhythmia problems. So, for example, tetrodo tetrodotoxin, which is from the pufferfish, that can also inhibit sodium channels. And there's now been research into how CBD can also block sodium channels. And they think this is what kind of like slows the brain down and stuff because it's stopping as many signals from firing out. Okay. When we talk about drugs and everything, we're going to talk about how sometimes we want signals to be inhibited because there's too much firing going on because there's something um, going wrong in brain, synapse firing, all of those things. So sometimes it helps to inhibit a few signals or sometimes drugs have to help get faster signals because it's not happening fast enough. Remember, all our brains are different, the same as all our bodies are different and all of that stuff. We're all going to explain it more in depth when we get to that section, which is next week. So now we've seen how the signal travels through a neuron. What happens when it reaches the end of a neuron and needs to get to the next neuron? Okay. So the axon terminal of one neuron at the end of it actually doesn't exactly touch the dendrite of the next um, of the next neuron. Okay, there's a little bit of a gap and that's called a synapse. So a synapse is where neurons meet to pass along a signal. Okay, the presynaptic, so pre always means from, through that depolarization process. It's now reached here. It ends in the axon terminals and then the dendrites are going to be close by, form a synapse between the gaps and this is going to be the postsynaptic neuron. And then again, from the dendrites, it's going to travel along the depolarization action potential effect to the end, to the axon terminals. Okay. At the start of a dendrite, where the synapses are meeting, so where the axon terminal and the dendrites are meeting at a synapse, these dendrites have something called receptor sites. We spoke a little bit about receptor sites or receptors a bit earlier, where we were saying that neurotransmitters in our cells always have a corresponding receptor that they like. Okay, receptors are quite, um, what do I want to say? They're quite fussy. They only like specific um, neurotransmitters to uh, bind to them, which is also how the body then regulates um, synapse signal. I mean, signals from neurons, because sometimes the wrong signal gets sent or an irrelevant one gets sent and we don't actually need to respond to it. It's more just a background thing that needs to happen. So that's why that neurotransmitter that's traveling along with the signal will then pass and find its right receptor. And if there's no receptor, well then, but cool, 
we'll try again later. Can I define a synapse as a functional gap between two neurons? Um, I prefer it to say that it's, yes, you can start with that, but that's not enough for a synapse definition because the synapse also, you need to say that it's, there's a signal transmission happening. Okay, it's not just a gap, it's the signal transmission involved. Okay, I took a note here, the, the terminal of the axon terminal and the dendrite aren't actually touching. There's the microscopic gap between them called the synaptic cliff. Okay, they're incredibly close together. It's microscopic even. So it's basically like when you tell your sibling to not touch you and they're like, I'm not touching you, but like their fingers like right there. Think of it like that. At the end of the axiom, the signal, it's all going to be released. And the neurotransmitter is basically going to hold the hand of the signal and say, okay, cool. I know where to go. I'm going to go to that guy. And it's going to go to the right receptor. Okay. Once it reaches its receptor, cool. Now the signal can be traveled along and go through the dendrites of the next one. You can see here beautifully, dendrite, cell body, axon, axon terminal. Over here is the little synapse and looks like they're touching but remember there's that cleft and in between the cleft the neurotransmitter is helping the signal that is now just traveled through this one to pass through that gap onto a receptor and then carry on through okay so Electrical signals can travel the gap between neurotransmitters, as we've just said. The presynaptic neuron, where the signal is coming from, will release those neurotransmitters into the cleft. The signal will travel with the neurotransmitter and then fuse with the receptor site. And then the receptor sites are, are um, specific to certain neurotransmitters, as we also spoke about. Okay, we're going to talk more about neurotransmitters um, next week and all the different ones like dopamine, serotonin, acetylcholine, and all of that stuff. Uh, all we need to know now is that neurotransmitters basically help signals to go through. Okay. Postsynaptic potential then is basically the voltage change that happens at the receptor site. Okay. If there's big enough change, then the neuron will fire and the one that's receiving the signal is going to be like, okay, cool, I've received something. Actually, you know what, this is enough. I'm going to fire again. And then again, we're going to see that action potential happen in that neuron. And then it's going to carry on traveling through, traveling through, traveling through like that. Okay. If there's a positive voltage shift, so there is enough, it's going to be called an excitatory. So it's excited, basically, postsynaptic potential. So the cell is less negative inside the cell than outside, which means that potential happens because there's a difference, there's polarization, so it can be depolarized, blah, 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 whole process starts again. If there's a negative voltage shift, an inhibitory PSP, it basically means mm, not quite enough of a signal. Um, you know, maybe if another one comes through, or maybe if more comes through, then maybe I'll fire. But it basically means that. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions before I let you go? We are at the end of the lecture. If you have any questions on this or the previous one, you can ask now. Otherwise, you can email me. I have been receiving email queries about things. I will still get back to everyone about the textbook. I spoke about that yesterday because some people didn't know where to find things in the textbook so the aim of the psp is to be neutral no neutral is always bad in biology because it means that things aren't going to react okay the psp wants to be positive because it means that neuron is going to then fire okay when is the first test you only have one test and that is on the 28th and 29th of april so not next week, Friday. Next week, Friday, remember, is your tutorial. But the following week, Thursday and Friday, your test is going to be open for you to complete. Okay, it's going to be online, MCQ, all of that. Details can be found in your first lecture. Those lecture slides are up.
our exams sit down, still in the process of discussing that. There's been a lot of back and forth emails that I've been CC'd in. Um, yeah, everyone in the department is still trying to decide because you guys are a massive group and it's a logistical nightmare. So we'll see. Your other exams will probably be sit down, but those departments will decide. Every department decides on their own. Any other questions? Okay, if you don't have a question, you're um, welcome to leave. Can you please re-explain ions? Okay, no problem. So ions basically are biological molecules that um, carry a charge, okay? Sodium and potassium have positive charges just based on how they are structured in their atoms and electrons and all of those things that we learn about in chemistry. But all you need to know is that sodium and potassium have a positive charge. So if there's a lot of sodium or a lot of potassium in something, it's going to have a positive charge. Chloride and large proteins have negative charges. Okay. And then overall, there's more um, protein and potassium inside a cell and more sodium and chloride outside the cell. But overall, there are more negative ions inside the cell, which makes that the inside of the cell a negative charge. Okay, probably means that those proteins, there's a lot of those proteins that are making things really, really negative and maybe not as much potassium. Okay, anyone else got any questions or something that they want me to go through again? Will we receive an email regarding the tutorial group venues? Tutorials are going to be online. Um, I did try to have them on in person or advocate for them to be on per in person rather. Um, but I haven't heard any feedback back from the department. And since that's next week, I sincerely doubt that they're going to suddenly get up and say that tutorial groups are going to be in person. So tutorial groups are going to be um, online in the allotted slot that you have. Um, if you're confused about that, just wait for an email this weekend. I'll be sending that out. Will the exam include both biological and developmental psychology? Yes, the exam contains 33% biological psych, 33% dev psych, and then 33% your of the course, and 33% of the exam will be the course that you're going to do after bio psych. Um, so starting in May, basically, and that is going to be um, mental health and wellness. Okay, and that's with Miss um, Philippa Hain. She's a local psych counseling psychologist in Makanda, and she's also a contract lecturer like me. Really cool lady. Um, I think you guys are going to really enjoy it. It's a really, really cool course. Will the exam be MCQ? Indeed, it will be. Okay, so don't worry. Don't bring your pencils and panic about having to draw a motor neuron for me. You just need to understand it and be able to answer some multiple choice about it. Okay, and then just remember my email's always open. Um, the only people I am screening and not replying to at the moment are the tutorial group people, just because that's going to be sorted out now this weekend. There was a resignation of a tutor, so things had to be shuffled around quite a bit. Um, but don't worry, we are looking after you guys and we haven't forgotten about that. It's just quite tricky to assign 700 plus um, psychology one students into 43 tutorial groups. It's quite bad. All right. I'm going to stay on for another two minutes. If anyone has a question, feel free to ask it. Otherwise, get out of here. Enjoy your long weekends. Remember, Mondays are off as well, as far as I'm aware, because it is um, technically Easter Sunday observed, but it's called Family Day. So, yeah, make sure that you have you get rest well this weekend, and I will upload these slides a little bit earlier than usual as a little treat.
are the only channels the sodium ones they are also potassium channels they are protein channels they are chlorine channels i think no i think those just are active transport um but yeah there's there's a heck of a lot of channels there's also um pumps that kind of push them through if they don't just want to travel through um if you have the misfortune of doing biochemistry like i did in my undergraduate degree you're going to have to be expected to memorize almost all of them and they have very stupid names like p13-7 or whatever so yeah only ones we're going to worry about now for this are the sodium channels because they they kind of kickstart everything okay if you are doing biochemistry, don't worry. You've still got two and a half years until you have to worry about it. Even if there would be sit down, would it still be MCQ? Yep. For I don't know how long. Um, I've only been at Rhodes for six years. Um, but as far as I can recall, MCQ exam format has always been used for psychology 101. 102 is also MCQ. And psychology 2 onwards is not. So it's coming. It's not always going to be this easy. Okay. I am going to log off now. Um, yeah, if you have anything, you can email me. Enjoy your long weekends. I will be sorting and working this weekend. So don't stress about me eating a hot crust bun. Um, feel free to email me if you need me. Okay. Bye.